Hello students, in this video we'll prove Kepler's second law of planetary motion using differential equations. So we recall that force is equal to mass times acceleration, that's one of Newton's laws, and the other Newton law that we're going to use in this video is that force is equal to negative at gravitational constant, big mass, little mass, and of course this is the relative size of the force, over the distance between the center of masses squared. Okay, so those are both Newton's laws for force, these are the Newton laws. And now, of course, here's the situation we're going to apply these two. We're going to apply them to the following situation. We have the sun. That's the center of mass of the sun. We have Earth, which is much smaller over here. That's the center of mass of Earth. So that's Earth for us. That's where we live. And we're going to let the distance between these two things, of course, be R of t, right? So the distance between those two center of masses, I'm going to call that R of t. That's going to be a distance, and that's changing with time, right? As Earth moves, as we move in orbit, that's changing. And there's also going to be a theta of t over here. So that's going to be theta of t, angle. So both the angle that we make with respect to the sun, with respect to some polar axis, and the radius are changing over time, right? And so I'm going to do to like formalize this a little bit, is I'm going to say that we have E1 hat of theta is going to be cosine of theta i hat plus sine of theta j hat, and E2 of theta is going to be negative sine of theta i hat plus cosine of theta j hat, okay? And so then our position is going to satisfy the following relationship. Our position vector r, capital, r capital, is going to be this little position vector, this distance r of t, and then e1, because it's I'm just putting in polar coordinates, so it's going to be e1 hat of theta, and of course theta really depends on t as well, okay? So that's going to be our position r of t, right? And so I know the derivative of r capital with respect to t is going to be the velocity, the second derivative of r capital with respect to t is going to be the acceleration. So I want to do two derivatives of this function r with respect to t. Now it's important, I'm, going to, I'm using the chain rule a lot here, so let's do this. If I do the derivative of e1 hat with respect to theta, let's see what we get. I'm going to get a negative sine cosine, so I'm going to get, ne I'm going to get an e2, e2 hat of theta, and if I did the derivative with respect to theta of e1 hat, of e2 hat, rather, what will we get? We'll get a negative cosine and negative sine, so that's going to be negative e1 hat of theta. So those are the theta derivatives of e1 and e2 hat. Okay? Great. So let's do it. So what's our velocity? Our velocity in this problem, v, is dr dt, which is going to be what? It's going to be... I'm going to suppress the t now. It's going to be dr dt e1 hat. Cover all those are functions of t still. And then plus r, and then the derivative of e1 with respect to t. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the derivative of e1 with respect to theta, then the derivative of theta with respect to t. So this is really the derivative of, so what I'm doing over here is I'm saying that the derivative with respect to t, d by dt, is really d by d theta, times d theta dt. So I'm going to do a theta derivative of e1. The theta derivative of e1 is e2, so it's going to be r e2 hat, and then times d theta dt. That's the first derivative. That's the velocity. Now I want to do the acceleration. The acceleration is the second derivative, so let's do the acceleration. So acceleration is going to be what? Is going to be, well, it's going to be d squared r dt squared e1 hat, then I'm going to have a dr dt, dr dt, times the derivative of e1 with respect to t. So it's going to be e1 theta. e1 theta we know is going to be e2. So that's going to be an e2 hat. And then the derivative of e1 with respect to, uh, the derivative of theta with respect to t, d theta dt. Great. Now I have three terms to differentiate over here. Let's do it slowly. So I'm going to have a dr dt, e2 hat, d theta dt. Great. And then we're going to have what? Then we're going to have an r, then a d e2 dt. Now the derivative of e2 with respect to theta is going to be negative e1, so that's going to be a negative e1 hat. And then I have to do a theta dt. So I have a theta dt times theta dt, so I'm going to have a theta dt squared. I'll have one theta dt from this factor over here and another from the differential. And then finally, I'm going to have a what? I'm going to have an r e2 hat and then a d squared theta dt squared. So that's the second derivative over here. 
Now let's do a little bit of bookkeeping over here. So notice that this term over here and this term over here are exactly the same. I have two of those copies. I'm gonna wrap all the E1 terms together over here. So what are the E1 terms gonna be? So the E1 terms are gonna be d squared r dt squared. That's an E1 term. Then over here, and there's one sign missing over here. So the sign is over here. When I did the derivative over here of E2, I needed a negative E1. So this is a negative E1 over there. So then we have a negative r and then um, a d squared theta. Ding. That's my E1 coefficient. And now what are the E2 coefficients? The E2 coefficients, I have two of these. I have two dr dt d theta dt. Those are those two terms over there, the common terms. And then the other E2 term is this term over here, plus an r, and then a d squared theta dt squared. That's E2 hat. Okay. Now here's the beautiful thing. So now we're going to get two, two of the capital's laws from the same equation over here. So we know that, the, so if I do mass times this expression over here, so mass times acceleration is the force. So this expression over here, mass times this expression is the force. And we know the force is a central force. This is a central force. Meaning that's in the direction of E1 hat. Which tells me that these E2 hat terms over here must be zero. So those terms have to be zero. So hence, that's the central force assumption, two dr dt, d theta dt, plus r, d squared theta dt squared has to be equal to zero by the central force assumption. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this entire expression by a factor of r. So I'm going to put an r over here and put an r squared over here. That's not going to change the differential equation at all, right? But now what this does is this makes us a perfect derivative. What this is over here is this, and we can check now that this is the differential with respect to t of, I claim it's r squared d theta dt. So let's check that. It's the derivative of the first function, r squared, which is going to be a 2r dr dt times d theta dt, plus the first function, r squared, times the derivative of the second function, d squared theta dt squared. Beautiful. So this is equal to zero. So we've just proven that if r is the rate, is the distance between the center of mass of the sun and the earth, and theta is the angle of inclination in, with respect to this polar axis, then it must be the case that r squared d theta dt is a constant c. Because the derivative is being zero means that the derivative means the function is a constant. And now what I can do is I can integrate this with respect to t, right? If I integrate this from t1 to t2, r squared d theta dt dt. Well, if I integrate c from t1 to t2, that's just going to be c times t1 minus t2, t2 minus t1. And now, of course, this is what? This is the area that's swept out by that polar curve between T1 and T2. So this is the area swept out between T1 and T2 times. And that's going to be equal to C times T2 minus T1. So the area swept out by an orbit only depends on the difference in time, and that is Kepler's second law. Kepler's second law says that the area swept out orbits sweep equal areas in equal time differentials. That's Kepler number two. Okay. To prove Kepler's first law that the actual orbit is an ellipse, we're going to have to go back to the same equation in a future video. In the next video, we're going to look at this part of the equation over here, and we're going to equate this part of the Kepler law with the force 
condition from the Newton's law of gravitation and write down a differential equation which will solve in polar coordinates and see that the orbit has to be an ellipse. That is the Kepler first law. And then in the next video after that, we'll show the Kepler third law, which says that once you have an ellipse, the relationship between the length of the major axis and the perimeter is given by some proportionality in terms of the different powers of those expressions. Thank you very much.